So this morning, as we continue our series, we're going to talk about perhaps one of the mo- more unsavory aspects of a healthy church, but something we've got to talk about because the Bible talks about it, and that is, what is church discipline? What is church discipline? But before we get started, let's uh, pray together again one more time. Oh, Lord, I... Thank you for this church and for this church family. And Lord, you've saved us by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have made us, Lord, into a people. And we as Cottondale are a local expression, God, of your universal uh, body. All those, Lord, who call on the name of the Lord, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who embrace you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, as we continue this series, I just pray that you would mold and shape our hearts and minds individually, God, and collectively to understand uh, and to be, God, a, a healthy church, as healthy, Lord, as we can possibly be, to think deeply, Lord, about the scriptures and what they um, call us to do as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that we'll be found faithful. And we pray, Lord, that as we seek you and obey your word, Lord, that you would draw people to you, that you would um, bring the fear of you, God, upon us, and that people would know, Lord, that there is a God in Cottonelle Baptist Church. There is a God in Dodge County, Lord. There is a God in this world. Uh, He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us now, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And, um, and again, I just kind of want to make a note that, that um, uh, uh, the, a large portion, uh, uh, I'm taking most of um, my points uh, this morning and through this series from Mark Dever's book called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, which I commend to you. And uh, we're going to talk about church discipline this morning. Church discipline used to be held in quite high regard by Baptists. Um, and it goes, it goes along with our understanding of congregational polity. And that is that there's no governing structure over the church. Each church is autonomous. That is, that is it is governed by its own membership and works in cooperation with other churches. But each church is autonomous. There's no overriding uh, authority structure above the local church. And of course, this makes church discipline incredibly important because uh, to be a member means you are part of the governing authority of your own church. And, um, and to not make sh- ensure that those who are members of your church are walking in uh, lives consistent with the faith that is in Jesus Christ, then you're going to have all kinds of problems. Uh, we might ask the question, why has there been a decline in church discipline? Uh, Greg Wills, who is actually one of my seminary professors, uh, wrote a book some time ago called Democratic Religion, where he actually studied uh, the practice of church polity and church discipline um, uh, in the early days of the history of our country. And in fact, the churches that he focused on were churches uh, actually here in Georgia. And he comments on why it may, might have come about that church discipline uh, declined within our churches. He says, he, wrote, he writes, Young Baptists refused in increasing numbers to submit to discipline for dancing, and the churches shrank from excluding them. Urban churches pressed by the need for large buildings and the desire for refined music and preaching subordinated church discipline to the task of keeping the church solvent, that is, financially viable. Many Baptists shared a new vision of the church, replacing the pursuit of purity with the quest for efficiency. They lost the resolve to purge their churches of straying members. No one publicly advocated the demise of church discipline. No Baptist leader arose to call for an end to congregational censures. No theologians argued that discipline was unsound in principle or practice. It simply faded away as if Baptists had grown weary of holding one another accountable. 
We have to think about church discipline because Jesus Christ talks about it. And if we're going to be a healthy church, we have to think about what the Bible teaches and about what we're called to as believers of, uh, as believers of Jesus Christ. And I believe that when we take all that God has written seriously and fearfully in the fear of the Lord, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in our lives. It makes a difference in our church. It makes a difference in the community when the outside onlooking world says, man, they really take what they believe seriously. And the problem is one of the greatest problems that we face as a church in America is that too many people look in on the church and say they don't even really believe what they say they believe. And so we as a church must take even the hard things seriously. And so we're going to talk about church discipline this morning. And we're going to begin by reading this uh, most prominent passage from Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. So now if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them... Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. The word of God. You may be seated. Uh... We're going to go at this uh, by talking about three points concerning church discipline. Number one, we're going to lay out a biblical basis for church discipline. And then number two, we're going to address some objections to church discipline. And then number three, I'm going to explain why church discipline is important. So first, a biblical basis for church discipline, and then objections to church discipline, and then why church discipline is important. So first, number one here, we want to lay out a biblical basis for church discipline. Uh, Of course... Everything that we do as a church needs to have a biblical basis. If the Bible talks about it, we need to do it. If the Bible says we need to do it, we need to do it. If the Bible doesn't say we need to do it, then we don't need to do it. But if there is a biblical basis for church discipline, then we need to be committed to it in the fear of the Lord. The first text that I want to look at before we get to the Matthew 18 passage um, is, is a, this, a passage in, in Hebrews chapter 12 where... Um, the writer is explaining about discipline in general. So it's important for us to understand the biblical concept of discipline in general so that we can understand the heart and the manner in which we are to exercise church discipline. And so uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, he says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. I'm going to read that verse, verse 10 again. They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he that is God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, in this first passage, the first thing we need to understand about discipline and the biblical concept of discipline in general is that discipline is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. When we think about discipline, we think that we, sometimes we just think about it in terms of surely uh, that it's a negative thing. But it's, the Bible says it's a good thing. The author says that to be, to be disciplined means that you are truly a son of God. If, God, if you weren't a child of God, he wouldn't discipline you. It, it, because we are children, then, then because, that means we are disciplined. Loving parents always exercise a healthy discipline over their children. Because that's what good parents do. 
in Proverbs, in fact, it says that if you don't discipline your children, you hate them. And so, of course, God, who is the perfect father, disciplines us. Why? Because we need it. (laughs) Because we all need correction. Because we all have an innate tendency to sin. We all have a sin nature. We have a natural tendency to do wrong and not right, to be selfish rather than selfless. Given, given over just to ourselves, we will always take the easier route if given the option than to do the right thing when it's hard. Even if we want to do it. Sometimes we know the right thing to do. Sometimes we want to do the right thing, but we just can't make ourselves do it. We just can't find the inner resolve to do it. That's where discipline comes in because we need help from other people. We need encouragement from other people. We need guiding and leading. We need other people. I mean, you think about children. And the, the, the children need us to discipline and to put up fences. To say, hey, you can only go this far. If you think about children, you know, it's just, you, there's, you know, children who lie, cheat, or steal, or who never learn to control their desires or their emotions. Who never learn to curb their appetites but are driven solely by their fleshly desires, who never learn to work hard and are never made to work hard. Who, children who are never disciplined. What a tragedy! Because they become victims of their own selves. And they grow up to make decisions that ruin their lives, that destroy their relationships. And on top of all this, after all that happens, they blame it on somebody else. If we love our children, we discipline them, we teach them that yeah, you have to exercise self-control in life, that you have to do what is right even when it's hard, that no, you can't say that. And yes, you will do that because those are, these, are, these, these are things that honor the Lord and that's, that's how you love other people and put other people before yourself. Love compels discipline. It compels discipline. To let your child play in the street and not tell him that he can't do it because you don't want to hurt his feelings is not love. It's hate. You hate your child if you don't tell them what is right and wrong to do. Love compels discipline. To see our loved ones straying off into the land of destruction and to do nothing, that's not love. It's hate. Discipline is good and we all need it. We need it from God, and we need it from one another. So, now that we understand that discipline is good, we can look back at our text there in Matthew 18. And Jesus here gives us the pattern uh, for church discipline. and The manner in which we are to address sin and grievances within the church. How many problems in the church could be dealt with? If we followed the biblical pattern, and if we did it early, and sooner rather than later, before things become big problems, or before people have wandered so far astray, that's almost impossible to bring them back. We often, when we think about church discipline, we often focus on that final step of excommunication. But really, that's just at the very end. That's just in the extreme case. If we do these things correctly, then those cases should be few and far between. Very few wrongs should or or, or ever will reach that point if we handle these situations biblically. If we've been sinned against before you go to anyone else, you go and address that person, person to person. And note, in this case, in this case, Jesus actually commands the offended party. To be the initiator in reconciliation. You see, sometimes we kind of sit back and say, well, I'm not going to go to them until till they apologize to me. Are you kidding me? If they're the ones who sinned against you, you think they're miraculously going to have a change of heart and come to you and beg you for forgiveness? What if I told my child, what if my child disobeys and I say, well, I'm not going to do anything until he apologizes to me? That's absurd. It's absurd. If someone is straying, the whole point is they don't, they're straying. They don't want to come back. They need someone to go to them to bring them back, to confront them person to person. And besides all that, oftentimes many grievances, if we're honest, are that the person might not even know that they've sinned or might not even realize that they've offended you. Or or it could just be a miscommunication. 
And so if there's some problem, then what you need to do is you need to go to them. Each of us should consider it our responsibility to initiate the reconciliation. And not put it off on somebody else. It's, it's my responsibility to initiate the reconciliation. To take the first step. And, it, and then it's only in the case of unrepentance then that you move forward. And then in that case you take one or two others along with you, the Bible says. And then if they still do not repent, only then do you take it to the church. And only then if they refuse to repent before the church do you excommunicate them or remove them from members, membership of the church. So why go through all of this trouble? Well, as we've just said, the answer is love. The answer is love. So you think about what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is assuming that somebody who is a member of the church, he's assuming that they're a genuine Christian. He's assuming that because they've professed faith in Christ and been baptized and have joined the, a, a, a local b- body of Christ, that they, are there, that they are a Christian. And so Jesus is assuming then that since they are a Christian, they, deep down they want to please God. Even if they've been entangled in sin, even if their heart has been hardened in a particular area, Jesus is assuming that they want to please God. And what, then, and what they need, therefore, is that someone to come along and just kind of, you know, sometimes we all need a little, a little knock on our door, if you will. Sometimes we all need that and say, hey, what's going on? What's go-? See, you see, Jesus assumes that. And so, in all these cases, what Jesus is assuming is that since this person has professed faith in Christ and has been publicly baptized, identifying with the church body and being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, that person, by joining the church, is, has, has already at some point publicly said that if I wonder, I want people to come after me. Because I love God and I want to please Him and I want to honor Him. And so by virtue of being a church membership, you are affirming that And you are affirming your willingness to have other people come after you when you get entangled in sin. Sometimes we all need a good spiritual whooping. But in the case of continued unrepentance, right? If the person refuses to repent, then basically, essentially what they are saying is that they no longer intend to trust and obey Christ. It's basically what's being said. And if if that's what, basically, if that's what they're saying with their lives then of course they can't continue to remain in, in membership of the church. You just can't. I mean, how can, you, how can you be a member of a church if you say, I have no intention to obey Christ, to serve Him, to honor Him in my life? You can't. It doesn't make sense. And so, and so it's only in these most extreme cases and hard cases of unrepentant sin, we then grief-strickenly publicly remove the person from membership. Why? In hopes... In hopes that such extreme action might jolt them and awaken them to come back to the Lord. That's why. That's why everything, every step of the church discipline is an act of love. It's an act of pleading. It's an act of saying, we want you to come back to the Lord. And the final passage we want to look at, and the, 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 one of the clearest and most strongest passages, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's the whole chapter, and we're going to read the whole thing here beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, <coughs> and of the kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Are you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Get this. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see that? That's why. That's why. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. 
For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So we looked at this passage uh, last week when we were discussing church membership because you have to have church membership to have church discipline. Because we're not, you know, it's not our job as Christians to go out and, you know, you can't, you can't excommunicate someone who's not a member of your church. But, however, it's different when someone has professed faith in Christ, has been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and has become a member, as every Christian should be, of a local church. And they have covenanted together to uphold our testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ together. Then, of course, that makes a difference. That makes a difference. In this passage, as we can see, it's just, it's, it's painfully clear. It's not ambiguous in the least. The church has the obligation to uphold those within its membership and in its Christian community to live lives consistent with the faith that is in Christ Jesus. We are those who have been called out from the world to Christ through faith in Him. That's what the church is. That if you have professed faith in Christ when, and you've been baptized, when you were baptized, what you were telling people is that my old self has died and my new, a new life, a new person, Christ now lives in me. I am a new person. And so through baptism, you have publicly made that proclamation. And in so publicly doing, your life now represents Jesus Christ. And so if there's a point in any of our lives in which after our profession, our faith no longer is reflecting that, is telling lies about Jesus Christ, then of course the church has the responsibility to guard its witness and integrity by addressing the sin in your life. Because if we don't, we tell lies about Jesus Christ and his gospel. And this is probably one of the biggest problems that we have. We say that the gospel makes no difference, that Jesus Christ makes no difference. We make a farce out of Jesus' crucifixion if we boldly and unrepentantly live in sin that we say Christ died to save us from. And Paul makes clear here, we don't hold non-Christian to, to Christian standards, but if somebody bears the name of brother... That's different. And we have responsibility to draw people back to Christ. In this final passage, biblical basis, uh, just briefly here is Galatians 6 1. Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so we see the spirit that is taking place here. It is it is it is motivated by love. And it is to be done with gentleness and it's to be done with humility. And in fact, Paul even says, keep watch on yourself. In other words, there can be great temptation to sin when you are trying to correct somebody else. And so it, mu- we must, it must be carefully done with humility and gentleness, but also with courage and conviction. And so biblical basis of church discipline. Is church discipline biblical? I think it is. Number two, objections to church disciplines. I'm just going to go quickly through a few objections to church discipline. Perhaps the number one objection to church discipline that people raise, and sometimes people in the church raise this objection, and that is, what about Matthew chapter 7? Verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. Well, that's a good question. Let's read the whole thing. Judge not that you be not judged. Why? For with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to a brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, 
when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what, the, what is this passage actually forbidding when Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged? In verse 2 it says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. So, the, so Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And the reason that he grounds that in is he's saying, because the way in which you judge someone else, you'll be judged in the same way. So what, what he's not saying that you can't exercise no judgment whatsoever. He's saying when you judge, you better not judge as a hypocrite. And if you read the whole passage, what Jesus, the, the point of this passage, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, is clearly Jesus is condemning hypocrisy. So, yes, I 100% agree with you. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. We should not be a hypocrite. And shame on us if we are going to call out people for sin that we ourselves practice. But that doesn't mean that what Jesus was saying here is that we can make no judgments on the fruit of other people's lives. And we know that for a fact because in the same book from Matthew chapter 7, in the same book, Matthew chapter 18, is the passage on church discipline. So either Jesus forgot what he said, or Matthew is schizophrenic, or Jesus understood that the two things fit together. And that is that, no, we shouldn't be hypocrites, but we do have a responsibility to hold those who profess faith in Christ to standards of uh, righteousness consistent with a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Mark Dever had a good quote about this. He said, he said, quote, if we cannot say how a Christian should not live, how can we say how a Christian should live? In other words, if we do as Christians have the responsibility and the right to, to speak from this Bible and from the pulpit to say what we should do, of course then we also have the authority to say what we shouldn't do. And so the first objection is you can't judge me, and that's just not true. In fact, the passage in 1 Corinthians 5 clearly says that. Paul says, is it not those inside whom you are to judge? Okay, the, the second objection that's, that people bring is it's unloving. People say it's, it's unloving. You know, and, and often this comes from those who have this very weak view of Jesus or a weak view of God, as we've talked about before, where God's just kind of like your, your senile grandfather who just kind of winks and smiles but doesn't really know what's going on. God's not like that. He's watching and he knows it's not unloving. Church discipline is not unloving because sin kills. Sin destroys. Sin ruins lives. It ruins relationships. It ruins marriages. It ruins families. It ruins governments and societies. And everybody knows it. And so to do nothing about sin, that's unloving. That's unloving. So it's just not true to say it's not loving. Love compels us to deal with sin. Uh, another objection, final objection, that sometimes is brought against church discipline is that it will hurt the church. So people say, well, church discipline will hurt the church. Well, it's an interesting example in Dr. Wills' book where he shows that in pre-Civil War days, Southern Baptists excommuted nearly 2% of their membership every year. So they would literally remove from membership for disciplinary reasons. A hundred-person church would, would move two people every year from their membership. And you know what happened? Those churches grew at twice the rate of the population growth. Why, why would that happen? I think this is the reason. Because when your church is known in the community as a church that really takes what they believe seriously, then the people looking on are going to say, wow, they really believe that. Maybe I need to see what's going on in there. You see, conviction and authenticity, and, and people can tell if you really believe what you say and it's that real genuine faith that real genuine conviction to do the right thing even when it's hard that's what attracts people that's what draws people who are really interested in Christ who are really interested in the gospel they want to, what the lost world needs to see is not a watered down version of Christianity what they need to see is Christians who really believe what they say they believe that is what makes Christianity 
powerful. And the more consistent and bold and courageous we are for Christ with pure and humble hearts, and the more we take seriously the integrity of the church, I believe the more attractive we become. Jesus said, if the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing. So, we've talked about uh, biblical basis. We've talked about objections. And finally, I want to talk about why church discipline is important. Why church discipline is important. Just a uh, few quick points here. Number one, church discipline is important because it's for the good of those who are disciplined. As we've said before, sin destroys. Again, many people, I mean, of course, people just assume the worst possible things. But we must be clear that church discipline is not vindictive. It is not... It is, not, it is not retaliation. It's not us trying to get back at somebody. What it is, is it's a Christ-given means, Christ-given means to help and love and do good to those who are caught in sin by returning them to lives and faith of obedience before the sin can wreak any more havoc in their life than it already has. James put it this way in James chapter 5. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So it's for the good of those who are disciplined. Number two, church discipline is important for the good of other Christians. For the good of other Christians, in the, in the 2 Corinthians 5 passage in verses 6 through 7, Paul says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. You see, when sin is tolerated, it tempts other Christians to engage in the same thing. It says it's okay. It says it's not a big deal. But when unrepentant sin is disciplined, it brings the fear of God on all people. And that's what we need. We need fear of God. We need fear of, of turning others who were considering walking down the same path. And there are stories after stories of church discipline cases where someone was on the brink of that. And then they say, but I saw what happened to them. And so I turned and didn't walk down that path. Right? That's what discipline is. When I, if my child plays in the road and I, I spank them because I don't want them to play in the road, I'm teaching them. I'm teaching them with a little pain to spare them from great pain. And that's what discipline is. And so it's, it's not just for the good of those disciplined, but it's for the good of other Christians. So that the fear of the Lord might fall upon us all. Number three, it's important because it's good for the health of the church as a whole. It's good for the health of the church as a whole. Wherever sin is removed from a congregation and the fear of God is stirred up and desire for holiness is fueled, then that church is going to be stronger, healthier, more bold, more courageous church, brighter, shining brighter in its testimony. It will be salt that hasn't lost its savor. And finally, uh, or not finally, but next, it's important for the corporate witness of the church. The corporate witness of the church. We've already said this, but it's worth saying again. The number one thing that we always hear against Christianity from somebody is that, well, I knew these Christians over there and they live like this. Or they did this to me. And reality is, and I'm not saying that's right. We shouldn't, let, we shouldn't let fallen people taint our view of the perfect Christ. But here's reality. Here's reality. A lost person, they're not, why should they read their Bible? They're not going to read their Bible. What does that mean? It means that most of the time, the only Christ they're ever going to see is from you. And from me. And so that means we really do represent Jesus Christ. And, it, and reality is, is, those things happen. These things have happened. And people who have professed faith have done some terrible things. 
But if but if that if that happens then if we do nothing about it then all we're saying is it's not a big deal. But but imagine in the fear of the Lord where something in that case does happen but then the church addresses it and deals with it. Well then at least the world knows, hey, they weren't on board with that. They're taking it seriously. They're dealing with it. So it's important for the good of those disciplined, for the good of other Christians, for the health of the church, for the corporate witness of the church. And finally, church discipline is important because we, must, we do it for the glory of God. Everything we do as Christians and everything we do as a church is for the glory of God. Jesus Christ commands church discipline. It is an act of obedience and it is an act of love. Care of other people's souls compels us to do it. So when we obey Christ and love souls, we glorify God. And the world will see that we take what we believe seriously and they will see our good deeds and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. So, is church discipline biblical? Is it loving? Does it make a difference? I think the answer to all these things is yes. You see, I think, I think, I think sometimes with good intentions in the past, what has happened is we, we thought, well, well, let's swing the doors wide open. Let's make it easy as possible to become a member of of the church. And then and then somehow we did the opposite too and then make it almost impossible to lose your membership. But guess what? That's almost the opposite of what Jesus said when Jesus said the way is wide that leads to destruction, but the way is hard that leads to life. Maybe it should be the opposite. Maybe 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 we should take church membership and church discipline seriously and and tell people hey before you, I'm going to dunk you into some water you better count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus and if you're going to be a member of this church you need to know this we're going to hold you to walk in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus and if you don't we're going to come after you you know what I think that'll, what that would do it changed everything. People would take, people will know that we mean business about our Christ. And when people see that we really believe it, it makes a difference in the world. And so as I close this morning, there's just a couple things I'd like to say. The first thing is this. The, there are two types of discipline that are, that are talked about sometimes. One is formative discipline. One is corrective discipline. We've been talking about corrective discipline, correcting a situation. But the vast majority of discipline is formative discipline. That is day in, week in, and week out, hearing the preached word, reading the Bible, learning about Christ, learning what he commands. Every Sunday there, are things, there is formative discipline. And so the point is this. Maybe today there's been some sin in your life. And you know it. And you haven't wanted to dealt with it. And no one's confronted you about it. Maybe nobody knows about it. But maybe the Lord has confronted you and convicted you about it. Then I plead with you today. You deal with that. You deal with that sin. You make it right. You tell somebody. If you need to make a confession to a particular person about it, you do that. And you make it right. And you, you purge this sin out of your life before it wreaks more havoc. And believe me, it will. All you got to do is give the devil one toe in your life. I'm telling you, if you leave the door open long enough, he's going to kick it in. If there's some sin in your life, then maybe this sermon has reminded you, now's the time. Repent, turn, confess. Find some accountability. That's what we're here for. Talk to somebody. Get some help. That's why we're here. And then the final thing is this. The final thing is this. Maybe, maybe you've been disillusioned in Christ. Maybe you're not a follower of Christ. Maybe you're not a member of this church. I don't know the reason. But if Christ is, if, if, if you can see Christ 
with eyes of faith this morning and see who he really is, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again from the grave to secure a people for himself that the Bible says who is zealous for good works. And if you want to be part of this community of faith, and if you want to know him, then it's, 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 it's hard, but it's easy, but it's hard. It's simple, but it's hard. All you got to do is surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You're not the boss anymore. He is. But when you surrender, it's freeing. And he forgives you of all your sins and he welcomes you into this family. And if you don't know Christ, I would plead with you to follow him this morning. And if you do know Christ, and if you're not a member of this church, I just want to ask, why not? Why not? You can join this church. You can be a member. You can become part of it. You say, Chad, everything you talked about, I don't know if I want a part of that. Why not? Don't you want people coming after you if you're tangled in sin? I do. I talked about it the other week. Pa- uh, pastor, you know, uh, someone just told me uh, that it was in the Macon Telegraph that wrote an article about it. The pastor who walked away. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to me. And if that means, if that means having somebody knocking on my door at some time, then so be it. Far better than the alternative of walking away from the Lord. We're a family. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I encourage you. If you can't if you can't be a member here, then go somewhere else where you can be a member. But don't date the church. Don't skim the surface. Go all in. And we'll see where God will take us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for